listening to Resist and Restore, a podcast from the Circle of Hope Pastors where we're extending the table of our dialogue. I'm Johnny Rashid. I'm Rachel Sensenig. I'm Julie Hoke. I'm Ben White. Welcome to our podcast. It's good to be together. We have a good show for you here. We're going to talk. We have a lot of different things to talk about, and I hope you have a lot of things to say back to us, too. That's what we're doing, some dialogue. We want to hear back from you because we're saying stuff. That's how the whole community works. So disability theology, a participatory defense hub interview with my friend Chris, and then spiritual show and tell. So packed with good stuff. You guys ready to roll? Yeah. Let's do yes. it. Let's start with talk back, shall we? Talk back, shall we? That's what he always says at the Sunday meeting, too, y'all. If you didn't, if you've never been to a Sunday meeting in the Circle of Hope, Johnny always says, "Shall we? Shall we do talk back?" You know, let's do some uh, talk back. It's shall so we? invitational. We? I like the, sh- I love I like it. the shell. I never use shell. <laughs> you know, like I feel like I like I feel like you're like you know really Bibly when you say shall. It's good. I mean, it's, it's a perfectly good word. There's no reason for that I couldn't use it. He is Bibly. I shall. I shall. I shall do some talk back, y'all. I shall. We shall. Seashells by the seashore. Back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're doing the out- we have an outdoor meeting now, and I have a because it's outdoors. I have a talk back microphone. I that. that's awesome. So people, because you have to talk back, and we have to hear talking you. back is the best. Yes, let's do it now. We're extending the table of our dialogue. Please, again, let us know what you're thinking about what we're saying right now, and what we'll say later, or what we've said before. Anything doesn't have to be current. Listen to our second episode and send us an email about it. And we'll talk about it on the next episode because we really – that's the point of this, this of this podcast. So we got an email from a friend who listened to our last episode where we interviewed Melissa Flora Bixler about her book, How to Have an Enemy. And uh, she said, listen to the podcast, really enjoyed the book review, but also appreciated the, your show and tell thoughts. This was specifically to you, Johnny. As someone with a physical disability – Theology has been an important journey of understanding how God sees me and how I see myself through God's eyes. I'd love to hear some of the resources people passed on to you. And I'll even add this part too. I feel like Circle has had a gap in this focus and awareness, but I've also seen incredible growth over the years. I've been part of the community. So so I appreciate that evaluation from someone that has a very different perspective from me. I can't really figure out what it is like to look at the world with... um, you know, a disability. I don't have one. So, what is um, disability theology? That's what you. That's what you. You introduced it as Johnny. Could you give us a short definition? So, theology is God talk. That's another way to say theology. It's talk about God, and it's it's what humans have to say about God as we're relating to God. And that's so, key. It's what humans are saying. It, right. That's mm-hmm. how we do theology. That's how we write theology. Disability theology is theology done by people with disabilities and for people with disabilities, right? Um, what made me interested in it was I have a disabled person in my cell. My cell actually became more accessible during the pandemic because it was on Zoom. That's interesting. And then mm-hmm. I, I, I reconnected with my friend who was disabled and she taught me a lot about disabled theology. So now I'm thinking about God through this disabled lens and I have a practical way to apply it. It's not just theoretical. This person's relating to God, and I can relate to this person better this way. So Mm -hmm. that's why it blessed me. Yeah, that's what you were saying in your spiritual show and tell. It was nourishing your soul because you were getting an expanded vision of God, and of and your theology was expanding because it's getting out beyond the edges of your experience, which we need. Yeah, we can relate to different people. Mm -hmm. Rachel and Julie, do you have anything to add to this definition? We're 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 figuring it out together. It's not like this is a glossary. What comes to mind is uh, theology involves kind of the lens, the way in which we see the world. And so I think it's just really important um, to be talking about this in terms of the way that everyone sees the world and people with what society deems as disabilities bring a really valuable perspective that I think even draws us closer to the heart of Jesus. So... I'm just glad we're talking about it here. I I was thinking even like, so I'm sitting here in our building at 2212 and I'm so blessed that there's an elevator in here that helps us be more accessible. But yeah, let's, let's keep having the conversation. I was just going to add, we, we were kind of very, we were out of touch on that when we were at our former building, we couldn't afford to put in uh, Mm -hmm. an elevator and we, we, we did feel terrible about it. And there Mm -hmm. are people in our community that were 
um, deterred yes. by, mm. by the steps that we had. It was, yes. it was a hard spot. Yep. That was painful. This might've been said earlier, but I guess what comes up for me is just how, what you were saying, Ben, about it expanding disability theology and the perspective that folks in the disability community bring expand our understanding of God, which mm-hmm. is just a, a a rich gift to the body of Christ. So mm-hmm. I've been grateful for that. Uh, even last week's talk back from our Sunday meeting was filled with good disability theology that has gotten me thinking throughout the week. And a, a resource that I will share that was uh, beneficial for me was the Bible for Normal People. There's an episode, their episode 165, we'll put it in the show notes, with uh, Stephanie Tate on disability theology. And she talks about how, you know, when Jesus did healings, it was often about restoring the person to society and creating, there was a social component, there was a way to um, restore them to community because of the way that the society had ostracized or uh, marginalized them. And so the healing Mm -hmm. that Jesus was doing, the wholeness that he was restoring was not because their disability was the problem as much as their broken relationships and um, isolation from their mm-hmm. community was the problem. And so Jesus was moving closer to folks on the edges and making a way for them to relate to him and to relate to their community. And I think to lift them up and their faith, mm-hmm. you know, why he, he's always saying it's your faith that healed you. And we often apply that to like, oh, my faith's so tiny, I can't get healed, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, but because of their position, they were, you know, that that looked down upon by society. And and Jesus is going to all the looked down upon places in society to to lift those people up That's right. as the examples of faith. Look, mm-hmm. here's where the faith is, y'all. Mm-hmm. This 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 is I mean, I'll heal them, sure. But check out their faith. <laughs> that, mm-hmm. that's, that's what Jesus is is interested in doing, is lifting those people up as an example for the whole community, which is what we're trying to do now as well, to keep lifting up these these examples of people that have this experience not just because it you know it's different or expansive and those are all good things but also because there's a there's a there's a, a, a still a need for restoration to be occurring and and we ought to look to the places that Jesus looked for faith yes and he he made space for their stories uh, for for them to tell their stories and their voices to be amplified, like the the woman with the issue of blood, she told the the narrative is she she came and told her whole story and the, and then was restored to the community and that seems powerful to me. Yeah, that's a great example. We could get into so many examples because Jesus is always healing people and and every mm-hmm. time there's a healing in the Bible, I, I think now I'll probably always think to to look to the disabled theologians to help me understand the story and to help me see better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's just, you know, I'm going to share some resources here. So, um, and I'll sh- add them in the show notes so that you can um, access them if you'd like to. But, you know, Jesus says it's better to, uh, it's better for those who can't see, but still believe, right? That elevation of those who can't see. Um, oh, wow. You could think of that as, as the folks who are actually totally. blind. And, and wow. G- I had never G- seen, I'd never thought of that as, as what he meant. It's connected to the blind person in John, right? At the end of John, he says that to Thomas, right? That's the, there's a, is that the end of John? It's at the, it's at the yeah. end of the book of John. Yeah, yeah that's to what Thomas. I mean. Yeah. So not, the end, not, not right there in that story, but definitely at the end, yeah. There's a theme in John about how it is better if you don't need signs. And sometimes those signs are healing to believe than if you do need them. And so people that are disabled have a different vantage point for connection to God, you know? And of course, how our society sees them really is different. You know, we think of a wheelchair as a sign of a disability, but rarely eyeglasses, you know, so what is normalized and what isn't? And how do we work this all out? Mm -hmm. Um, People to help you with this, love the podcast that Julie mentioned. There's a great series out from, let me just pull up the, you're going to hear me click around because I'm on a computer in case you were wondering. There's a great series about um, disability theology that you can just look up online and I'll make sure that you have that. A whole publishing house put out um, it's studies in religion, theology, and disability. 
And if you if you go to the show notes, you'll see a, from Baylor University a whole series that they did on this. And one of them is called Accessible Atonement. Atonement is the theology of the cross, how Jesus saves us through the cross and through resurrection by David McLaughlin. I'll give you a few more. Um, there's a whole Bible and disability commentary by Sarah Melker and Michael Parsons and Amos Young. Amos Young was someone to pay attention to, too. He wrote a book called The Bible, Disability in the Church, A New Vision of the People of God. And Nancy Iceland wrote a liberation theology of disability called The Disabled God. And then one more, Disability in the Way of Jesus, Holistic Healing in the Gospels and the Church by Bethany McKinney Fox. And Bethany really puts her money where her mouth is because she's, uh, she's opened up her home in California, she's a pastor in California, to help people with different physical and intellectual disabilities. And if that's something that you devote your life to, you know, um, there's definitely a jewel in your crown in heaven for that. I mean, that's that's real special stuff, in my opinion. Very saintly behavior. So we'll link those resources. I hope they bless you. And if you want to talk back more, be sure to do that with us. Resist and Restore podcast at circleofhope.net. So glad you're listening to our podcast and connecting with us. We really want to create community with you, a dialogical community. So be sure to talk back to us and connect with us with, in other ways. If you want other people to connect with our podcast, please like the podcast, subscribe to it where you listen to podcasts, and give it a good review too. All of those things help different people hear our podcast and see that it's out there for them. If you want to share money with us that helps keep things going, you can go to circleofhope.church and you can click the give tab and then you can share money with us right there. That'll help our church. It'll help our podcast and it'll also build our sense of mutuality. And while you're on our new website, circleofhope.church, check out cells, check out our outdoor meetings that are happening now and our online meetings. There's tons of ways that you can connect with us and share that website around too. If you think others in the Philadelphia region, in the Delaware uh, watershed or around the country, there's ways to connect. Friends, I am so happy to have my friend Chris Eden on the call with me. Chris Eden is part of our church, Circle of Hope. So we're like, we're siblings, we're family, and that that that's great. And I'm glad to share that with you. Chris Eden participates, now I'm going to sound redundant, in the Participatory Defense Hub. And I'm here to talk to you about what that is and how we can get involved. So welcome to our show, Chris. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. It's always, yeah. it's always nice to hear you call me your friend. That's, that's lovely. <laughs> we are friends. So tell us a little bit about what, what is participatory defense? Yeah, um, participatory defense is it's a national movement. Um, it, I mean, it could even be international. And it's participatory defense has this goal of helping people who have opened criminal cases participate in their defense. Um, the idea here is that People have more agency than they than they realize, um, and they lose agency in the kind of convoluted and complicated system of the of the legal criminal justice world. Um, and so, with some with with some training um, here, the Defenders Association of Philadelphia has been really generous in training us up in like how the court systems operate. So we have that. And then we also just like grow in our community knowledge with each participant who comes through. So we learn and we share in order for, for people with open criminal cases to um, identify where they are in their process and what they can do. Like now's a good time to call your lawyer. And when you call your lawyer, this, these are good things to talk to them about. Those kind of like, it's very practical. So you're saying you provide people with with agency that they do, didn't know they had before. And why yeah. don't they know that? Why don't we know all the rights and agency that we have as well, citizens? Yeah. So when you think about when you think about the criminal justice system, you can you can pretty easily bring to your mind three actors, right? The the judge, um, the district attorney, the like prosecutor, and the defender your defense attorney. Like, so there's these, there's these three experts, right? And behind them is the legislative branch of your, of your city, state, 
so you have you have like all these experienced educated and you have you have all these experts and and so i think where a lot of people sit is just like really in the expectation that these experts have their best interests at heart or are just too powerful for them to wield any influence over and so they sit at the sidelines and wait for an outcome so they feel disempowered or you're suggesting that when they put their hope in the system and they think the system has their best interest in mind that's a sort mm -hmm. of false hope yeah yeah and I, I would I would venture to say I don't think most people have have that hope. I think most people fall in this category of like there's that's just so many experts that are already like know more than I do and are like positioned against me that I, I'm really all I have is hope. Like I have yeah. I have I don't know what else to do. They have political power. They have education. Mm -hmm. They say they have experience. So you feel right. a little paralyzed. Yeah. Are the people and who, there's and there's just like the the like system of hearings itself that is complicated. Let's not forget the police at the very start of this process. Like you are you are sort of disenfranchised from the start with your first contact with the police. Yeah, because your 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 charge might be a problem too. Right. Let alone the right. whole legal process that follows that. Yeah. Yeah. Do people who need and participate in participatory defense um are you seeing any racial disparities there? Is this an issue that affects communities of color more than white communities? Uh, yeah, down down the line, and I'm not I'm not speaking just for our hub. We like I'm speaking from the from the standpoint of the South Philly Participatory Defense Hub, but there are um, a growing number of hubs in our city. And as a collective, we would all say that the disparity is along line along the racial line. Like, wow. So walk me through the process. What yeah, does the hub so do? How does it work? Let's say I'm I need help. What and because I'm caught up in the legal system, how would you help me? Yeah. So you've you you you've come to our our meeting on a Monday night. Right now, those are those are over Zoom. Um, so you you join us, and we're going to we're going to kind of gently pepper you with with questions like when is your next court hearing? What kind of hearing is it? Um, do you have an attorney? Who is your attorney? Um, have you talked to your attorney? What have you talked to them about? What are you being charged with? So it's like, it's kind of a laundry list of questions we're going to ask um, to kind of shake out what the person knows, what they, what they know about the process. Um, and so those, those answers identify what they already know, which is great, and the things that they can work on in, an, in really an alliance with their with their attorney you know so like we're kind of here to like give them those nudges so that's how the meeting's going to roll out so like the the end of the the meeting for that person is probably going to be a, a to-do list of next steps that they can take by themselves and in walking with their attorney closer to the hearing date um depending on the kind of hearing it is um we'll we'll try and offer support one of the things we'll encourage them to do on that list is like organize some people to come to court for you and we'll do the same. We'll, we'll find people in this hub and in the network and, and try and show up in person so that there's a community representation, which is probably one of the strongest tools of participatory defense, which like we, we can't really even claim because it's just, that's just really the, um, the power of the public space when people actually enter it. So what happens exactly? What does the community representation look like? Yeah. So more than once on, on days I have attended court on someone's behalf, that um, attorney um, will let the judge know. Um, so, so like, again, there has to be some communication between that client and their defender to let them know that there's people here for them, right? We hope they, we hope they have that conversation and, and I might just jump in and say, hey, I'm here. So that, that, that defense attorney is gonna turn back to the judge and say, there are people here for the for the client today and that's unusual like these these courtrooms often um because like most hearings um take take place in courtrooms where there's like 50 or 60 defendants and it's a really wow. short hearing and and most of the time the folks in that room are all defendants and maybe one or two family members so it's it's a marked difference when someone brings 
their neighbor or or like folks from the hub or like family members and there's like a gathering of even like four or five people as opposed to zero or one um that's that's a nod to like the value that this person has in the larger community the the commonwealth if and, you will yeah that makes a difference yeah it's pretty incredible we see these things in movies and you're saying yeah this really works even in person the it, community representation it, it does yeah yeah, I think it, because of this age, it's still rare, but it but it lets it lets the judge know, it lets the DA know that like one of the things it does is it lets them know that they, this person is cared for, and there's also people who are um, it, it's it's like a wedding, right? Like the 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 community is gathered to say we're holding you as like the husband and wife, and it's the same right. idea. Like we've got this person. So just just to back up a little bit, some people might be mm-hmm. wondering. Why, why bother helping people who have committed crimes? Aren't these people responsible for the consequences of their actions? Isn't this what we say? Yeah, but see, that already betrays a flaw, doesn't it? That question isn't based on the merit of the judicial system in this country, which is innocent until proven guilty. And that, that in itself is, is the problem. We start often from a place of if you've if you've been arrested if you've if you've been charged then you're guilty and that's and you've not committed a crime you've committed a crime right we should be saying is like you as the accuser need to prove it and and so we're really just pushing back for things to work as they are designed for one thing um and that mentality leaks out into other aspects of of our culture with with real effects because people with open cases whether or not they've been um w- when a case is open it hasn't been decided yet but but just the fact that someone has court hearings affects their ability to get employment for instance um those things show up on background checks and so there are impacts that lead to that mentality of conviction before a person has even been sentenced or not, depending on how the judge decides. So you're saying some people are guilty before they're innocent, right? Like you're proving their innocence and the system is set up in such a way. And right. You know, sometimes you're born into a circumstance where you're more likely to be guilty too, right? Yeah. And you know, like you can probably imagine if, if one of the things that you can't do while you're, while you're defending your yourself in court is, is work that's not going to help you find better means of making money. Like that, yeah, that's totally, a limitation that's, totally. that's already been set. So then in your work, and, and, and mm-hmm. you've alluded to this before, what are the apparent problems in the criminal justice system? What are, we, what are you noticing? Yeah. Where are the, you know, the racism of our society is one, police brutality is another. What else, what else do we have? One of one of the people at Defenders um, who, who who trains attorneys, um, Mary Fox and Johnny. I want to double check that name, but but Mary has this thing she says where like once once you're arrested, you you're like you're on a treadmill. You know, like this process is going to move in one direction. There's no space in the process for people to be like, stop, wait, did we did we really get this right? So the minute a person is arrested. You know, they they go to jail, maybe they post bail, or maybe they walk out on their own recognizance. Maybe while they're in jail, they can't pay their rent, they lose their job. There's this progression that occurs, and none of the none of the system actors, there's nothing in place for them to be like, stop, wait. Like, let's just make sure before we continue that we've done our due diligence. It's yeah. just like you're you're on a train toward mm-hmm. somewhere and you can't get off. And I think that's and that's the biggest problem. And that's where, where that leads is a national statistic of 95%, which, which is 95% of trials or non-trials, really. 95% of, of what actually happens in a courtroom is plea deals. It's, it's people who are just like, I can't take this anymore. And I'll plead guilty so that we can come up with some kind of agreement, sometimes jail time, sometimes community service, just so I can- Are there um, innocent people like that plead train. guilty? I would absolutely say so because for people who are who are just making enough, for people who are marginally housed, um, who have families, who have responsibilities, it's especially right now 
um, because of COVID this last year, courtrooms have been closed. People have been still been getting arrested. So there's this backlog of cases, which which really means that like people will may wait years before they get any semblance of a day in court. And that's just too long. So you're saying this, this the, the process itself can be more punishing, more traumatizing, more difficult than just saying, you know what, I'm innocent, but I can't keep navigating the system. I'll plea and give me a break, you know, less jail yeah. time, whatever the case is. I mean, that's a horrible circumstance to be in. It is. To feel that is. much stress on you that you just incur the punishment yeah. that you don't even deserve. Yeah. And so for our part in participatory defense, that gathered community um, starts to form somewhat of a stopgap so people can build some resilience to fight if they have cause to fight right. and, and, and stay in the process. And that does mean that there are, that in this gathering of people, like sometimes like we can identify avenues of help, like to, to help keep the person employed, to help keep them housed, you know, because like, it's really when you have that family, those friends that like you, you start to get more of a, a support system. Like we see so few of the people who are going through this. Right. Um, like we're, we're very small potatoes um, and, and see very few people in comparison. And so it is very understandable why, why people lose hope and uh, take mm. the deal take the time, take the, take the community service, take the record, take that short-term, seemingly short-term solution, um, even though it has long-term effects because they, they can't endure anymore. So we're, we're talking about some of the problems participatory defense hubs in Philadelphia and around the country are um, addressing. Do you mm -hmm. see yeah. long-term solutions to them? And let me throw another one mm -hmm. in there. Larry Krasner just won an election. Is he helping at all? Um, guys, there's the district attorney of uh, Philadelphia. Yeah, just a few this miles. is very interesting. And and so like for anybody listening, you can like Larry Krasner is he's national news and PBS has a, has a special about him. It's fascinating. Um, I'm I'm four episodes in and wow, there's a whole thing um, about him. The whole nation's can can be watching it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. PBS has a documentary about the Philly DA. I think it's called Philly DA, which is which is really interesting. And so. Right. So, so what's, what's in the DA's purview? The, the DA has this power to request what the Commonwealth wants. So they decide at the outset what charges to move forward with. When you get arrested, the police are going to throw the book at you. They're just going to like, and the book is the, the law. So they're going to, they're going to come up with a laundry list of charges. That's what they do. And then the DA decides what they're actually going to move forward with. But the DA also has the ability to, to ask for reduced sentencing, yeah, yeah. To, um, to ask that the judge not charge bail, like let the, let the person go on their own recognizance. Um, bail is, is one of the ways that really trips people up. They can ask for, for, for lower probation times at the end of that sentence so people aren't stuck returning to their judge for years, years and years and years. They have certain power, but the DA is just one component. There are also judges that um, can can override a DA's decision. Like the DA is not going to save us, but it kind of helps. Uh, but it is kind of helps. Yeah, it like when you when you have a DA when you have a DA that like doesn't want to like maximize sentencing and punishment at the start, the system as a whole does stand a fair better as long as. It has the support. And what you what you also see in that documentary is the DA is an outlier, at least, you know, when this was filmed, like he did not have the support of most of the judges or the um, Fraternal Order of Police, which um, are a powerhouse in our city. And I would I would venture to say most cities. So do you just see the police and judges as bad guys here? Do you? Is it, do you ever feel like you're in a situation where, and I, I don't expect this to happen, but I'm just, I have mm -hmm. to ask it like, yeah, that your work can end up doing something, uh, you know, letting a violent offender, for example, and I'm not even sure if you deal with violent offenders go when they haven't really been rehabilitated in any way, you know? Yeah. So first question um, is like, are these people bad mm -hmm. or is it bigger than that? And then second, how do you even... If you're dealing with somebody who's, you know, just to use the most heinous examples, right? Violent mm -hmm. offender, a uh, sex offender. How do you how do you work that out even in your conscience? Yeah, absolutely. So, 
to your to your first question, are the judges and police officers bad? It would sound that way. I mean, certainly I've said nothing that would betray any any sort of nuance, <laughs> but I don't believe that entirely. But I will say institutionally, policing and judging are are. Um, so the system is bad. Yeah, there there are such limitations that it's it's impossible for people who work in these institutions to exhibit the full range of their compassionate potential. You know, like certainly police have a very wide range of power. And what we see so often is an exertion of that power. Judges have a wide, a wide lane as well. And so what I will say is you are as good as the choices you're making about how to use the power you've been given. And I think that's the problem is these are places where people have a sense and embellish sense of their own power and um, mm -hmm. use it. And then you were asking about like rehabilitation and, and the worst offenders, right? Murderers, rapists, you know, people who abuse children physically and sexually. Like there's, these are like the, right? These are like the baddest of the bad. I will say we haven't really worked with anyone like that. And I also say these are agreements that each hub makes about who they help. Our latest agreement was we'll take anybody who comes to us. And within our hub, if any of our volunteers aren't comfortable working with someone like that, we're not forcing anyone to right. do anything they're not comfortable with. Um, because there's a whole host of um, people reasons. can be traumatized people, by that, you know? Right. And, and so we're not asking for people to reopen those old wounds. But we also, um, like, I'm a follower of Jesus. And so, like, I, I think that means that we, we start by seeing the world as, as wounded and seeing what we can do to treat the wounds. And that includes the people who come to us. And the first thing we need to do with those people in participatory defense is the thing the system also needs to do and treat them as innocent until proven guilty and care for them as people who have backgrounds and, and traumas of their own and may not even have done anything. So we have to be really careful with who we commit to guilt before their time. And you're motivated by this because of Jesus. I mean, you just said yeah. I'm a follower of Jesus. So that is uh, contributing to your vantage point. Definitely. How would definitely. Jesus, how does Jesus address these issues? You know, what motivates you about the ministry and the life of Jesus and even the death and resurrection of Jesus to do this work? Absolutely. I mean, I think the action that most informs me for participatory defense is Jesus on the cross in his, in his last conversation, one of his last conversations, mm -hmm. with his, which is with the convicted criminal to his side, who he forgives. And he goes further. Like there's, there's this idea that he forgives one of the two criminals and not the other. Maybe. Right. But really like what Jesus says in some of his last breaths is, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he's, he's really talking about everyone. So he's, he's in this position as an innocent person and the son of God to convict, right? And he uses his power in a different way um, to show mercy and to ask for mercy on behalf of people who are guilty. Just to, just to add to this, yeah, Jesus is freeing and liberating people who not only have been charged, but have also been convicted. Right. You know, so right. that's, that's even more radical. Yeah. And I realize with, with, within that, I mean, like the, the other thing is, is like, there's only so much I can do. I mean, like I, I want to follow Jesus into that, into that realm of forgiveness and I do it as much as I, I can. And I don't do it as well as I, I probably can. So like, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to follow his example in participatory defense, but there is also a question of how, how we deal with people who have really done egregious things, right? I think that was one of your questions as yeah. well, yeah. Um, which I will say is, is not the, is really not the purview of participatory defense. Um, so I won't speak about it from, from that level, but um, I am happy to have um, Donna Jones in my head from a, from a conversation we had with her on our sister podcast, um, Color Correction. Yeah, um, listen to that. You know, she talks about the percentages as well of people who commit these egregious acts who are convicted and are in prison. And they, they don't represent the majority by any stretch. They are special cases and actually should be treated as such. And, and we should, to the best of our collective ability, what we need to do at the outset is decide that we want to bring people back to their wholeness. 
Like, I, th- I think that's the first thing. We have to start with a commitment to treat people as people, even if they've done something awful. And then, and then discern how best to help that person rehabilitate. And, and also let a portion of that be their own decision. So I don't, I don't know how that all works out, but I think like starting with a different assumption about the grace and the impact it can have could get us a lot further. Wonderful. You think that Christians who are recipients of the grace of Jesus, who have been exonerated, who have been granted amnesty, who have mm-hmm. been given forgiveness and liberation, yeah. When we do this work, when we support the work of participatory defense, we're acting like Jesus. Absolutely. Absolutely. And a Jesus that like forgives and holds to account. That's the thing. I mean, what I hope we do with participatory defense, and I don't, like again, because we're not we're not worried about whether or not people are innocent or guilty. We're we're different than than other parts of the system. I want to make sure that our focus is on the potential each person has toward transformation. This is a question you guys addressed on color correction. Mm-hmm. It was after Chauvin got mm-hmm. was convicted, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, um, yeah. And I just think this adds nuance. Absolutely. And I think this just adds to the Christian dialogue. What would you do if Derek Chauvin Derek was trying to solicit the resources of participatory defense. Now, I don't know if I could do that. Maybe that would be a case where I'm like, you know what, guys, someone else do this one because I can't, I can't do it. That's a very good question. I'm not trying to trip you up. I just want, I'm just trying to expand the conversation. No, I, I, I appreciate the challenge because I don't even consider the possibility of that. Um, But it's, it's good to think about that. Like, yeah, cops are pretty well represented for what it's worth. Yeah. So it's unlikely that they would be in the situation just to be, Right, Li- clear about the circumstance, but just as a hypothetical. Yeah, Woo. with such a high-profile boy, I don't know. I, I'd, I'd hate to, I'd both hate to say we turn him away, and I'm, I'm not excited with the, uh, <laughs> with the prospects of supporting someone like that. And that, really, what that that does is, is show perhaps my own limitations when participatory defense as, as designed probably would be a good thing because what what we need to understand about participatory defense is is it's not about getting people off it is really about holding a system accountable to its best work and to its best Uh, outcomes to what it can be yeah yeah and so in in a in a case like Derek Chauvin I I think we could support him I would that would take a lot of prayer and and a lot of like and a lot of emotional support like that's that's because what i'd be navigating the whole time are my own feelings about this person's guilt in ways that i don't normally do i tend to believe most of the people who come to us even if they've committed a crime like they weren't really operating with like the best range of circumstances or options and i don't see that for derek chauvin so it would it would certainly challenge my limitations and um and perhaps the limits of participatory defense When we think about criminal justice and punishment in the United States, we can look at a system that's clearly broken Yeah. um, because mass incarceration doesn't stop crime, right? Like those things don't really work together um, like we think, right? So I think Andrew Yang of Color Correction taught me this. There's five recognized purposes of punishment, right? Deterrence, incapacitation, rehabilitation, retribution, and restitution, you know? And to me, the fullness of the reason I would represent Chauvin is because really putting you in jail might, does incapacitate you. Yep. It it doesn't deter other cops from doing what you did. Not really, because it was such a big deal that even happened to you. Does it rehabilitate you? I'm not sure you'll be better at the end of this. Does it offer retribution? Retribution mm. for death? Are you like that? What is that? Retribution right. for death is death. So no, that's not happening. I'm not sure that I want that to happen. Um, yeah. And restitution does it make does it does it does it solve the crime? And so, the legal system is broken. You try to help right. people navigate it to get its best outcomes. They're not always guilty. So if they're innocent, they really need it. And if they're guilty, right. you're trying to really give them the best opportunity they can to get the best out of it. You know. Right. Right. Even, even for someone like Derek Chauvin, I don't, I don't want him to just rot. Like that's that's not my, that's not my wish for him as, as a person. Like I want him to get better. 
and certainly like Johnny, what you're saying, our, our prisons are not a place that um, really perform for the um, well-being of its population. They, 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 they really focus on making it hell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's a good description. And Jesus liberates us from hell, um, truly. Yeah. Did Circle of Hope, or the church that we're both in, shape any of your convictions that move you to do this work? What I love about our, our community is that it wasn't a question of whether, in, 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 in my mind, in the mind of Andrew and Beth, who I started this project with, it wasn't a question in my mind of whether Circle of Hope would support it. I didn't, I didn't have that concern going into conversations about starting a hub at our, at our church because we have already basic tenets about racial disparity and a commitment to stand against that. Um, and also, like, we have a commitment to aspects of the gospel that have to do with, with mercy and compassion and forgiveness. And, and, and further, like, the work of participatory defense already came out of a different compassion team, Circle Mobilizing Because Black Lives Matter. Right. It's really birthed from work we were already doing and seeking um, really something uber practical to, to um, all the conversations we were having just about how wrecked so many of our systems are. Right. Taking, taking a lot of that theory and knowledge that we collected and conversations we've had in our church and, and doing something practical which is also something I love about Circle of Hope. It's the seeking of practical solutions. You know, well, let's, get, let's get to the practical then with that in mind. Yeah. Um, can you share a success story if that's if you can call it success? How has your work actually, what has it resulted in? Just give us one. One of my favorite successes, there are, there are really two that come to mind and these are both young women. And that, that really means so much to me um, that the, like, one in particular came to us. This this young woman was like back and forth between here and another state. Like she she's from Philly. She she picked up a charge in her youth um, and then moved away, but flew back back and forth to be at each of her hearings wow. by herself. She kept this like the, so much of this is not a reflection on participatory defense, but on her character because she was so organized. Like one of like. One of the things we encourage people to do is make what's called a socio bio packet where you where you like put personal information together, things like character letters from people, maybe photos. She was a musical artist, so we we're like, why don't you put some like songs and, and a CD to, for the like in the packet? And she was so organized, like in her in her defense, she had all these receipts that she'd kept, um, which which were important in her case. One of the things we did is as a group of hubs um, is we helped her make a socio bio video with her father and other, and other people in her life to like talk about her character as well. So like mm. there were some like deliverables, like this, like this packet that she put together and this video, but really all those things could do is bear witness to the creative, inspiring person she was. If she wasn't those things, it wasn't going to come through. So really it was just, it just so, brought out her her real self. Yeah, like yeah. we were able we were able to to like show her some practical tools and 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 we had access to things like Philly Cam where we made this video, you know. So like we we were able to use some of our leverage and really yeah again like that's that's what participatory does is it is it brings out the best in people like that best has to be there for it to come out, but that's where we like to start. Is we just think awesome. it's in there. That's awesome. That's awesome. What's the best way that we can support the work as listeners or as members of the church? I would say hello to our national audience and our local audience. Um, see if there's a participatory defense hub in your city. And you can find out by going to participatorydefense.org. The movement was started in San Jose. They're the folks that host the website. And that website has a pretty comprehensive list of all the places that um, participatory defense is, is working right now. You can you can reach our hub, the South Philly Participatory Defense, through Facebook. You can just um, search the South Philly Participatory Defense. We're on Instagram um, similarly. Okay. Um, so if you have questions, you can you can reach out to me and our our group. Yeah, that would be the best place to start. Great. So we can keep up with your stuff on 
South Philly Participatory Defense on Facebook and on Instagram, mm-hmm. and you can go to this website and find out okay. if there's a hub and possibly get connected to people that can help you start one if you want it in your area. Absolutely. Yeah? Yes. Well, that's great, Chris. And this is this yeah. this conversation's been so good. Um, I appreciate you going back and forth with me on it. And <laughs> you know, my, my my blessings to you in your ministry. Thanks again for doing this. Yeah. And and as a pastor, thank you for supporting us. Of course, of course. This means a lot to me. And I'm gr- I'm really glad to be part of a church doing this. Me too. Yeah. Excellent. Awesome. We like to end our podcast episodes with a little conversation on what's been nourishing our souls recently. And we need the soul nourishment as much as anybody else, don't we, pastors? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we are, we try to be always looking for um, the little nudges from the spirit, sometimes uh, that quiet whisper or what's been getting our attention in ways that feels nourishing to us and helps us see God in more ways. So this is spiritual show and tell. Pastors, what has been nourishing your soul recently? I uh, got some soul care through spiritual direction this past week. And um, spiritual direction is is like a, like a regular discipline where I meet with a spiritual director who has been trained to listen with people for the ways that God is directing them. So it, it's not like mm-hmm. they're the advisors, the spiritual advisors or something, but they are listening for what God's doing and what, where God's movement is happening in someone's life and helping, helping me to listen for that too. So that's a regular discipline that we all have as pastors. And uh, I, I met with my spiritual director last week and came away just so grateful for that hour of time with someone else to kind of sit sit in that seat with me and listen to me um, and listen to God in that moment and um, help me do some discernment. I, like I had, I had some revelation, you know, like I felt like I was hearing from God in that moment about myself and ways that God wants to keep working with me and in me. Hmm. And that, that was a gift. So if you are interested in spiritual direction, I mean, we do this kind of spiritual direction in some ways with each other through ourselves all the time. Um, you know, we, that's, mm-hmm. that's what we do when we meet together. We're really listening for God as we listen to each other. But if you want a more formalized, regular, you know, relationship with a spiritual director, we have those resources on our, our website, wayofjesus.circleofhope.net. Um, and other other information about spiritual formation. So we'll include that in show notes for you. Thanks, Julie. That's powerful. Yeah, we all go to spiritual direction. Mm-hmm. That's an important part of uh, our discipline these days. Mm-hmm. How about you, Ben? What's been nourishing your soul recently? Dolly Parton. <laughs> Dolly Parton. How so? <laughs> Well, I might have said this on the show earlier, but I fell in love with Dolly Parton for real when I listened to Dolly Parton's America by Jad Abumrad of the podcast Radiolab. He did this whole series. He's from Tennessee. He's a a Lebanese first-generation guy living in Tennessee, and it's just a great that that's great but i listened to that years ago so that's not what it is what what it is this week you know but but dolly parton just kind of seeped into my pores via i don't think show. you told us that before by the way and this is this is new okay, to well, me <laughs> dolly parton's america is a great listen go check it out on all your podcast places and while you're there give us a review a high review not us like resistant restore podcast because you know you're there just do it. I'll try. <laughs> um, but no, Dolly Parton this week for me was singing with Zach Williams. I don't know when this song came out, but do y'all know the song There Was Jesus? Have you heard them sing that oh together? Oh my gosh. My friend Audrey just sent that to me. Yes. In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing and the hurting. Um, I can't. I, every time I sing, no one can ever tell that I was I was singing the song that I was singing, unless I like have a company because I'm like in the wrong key. I think he's. I think you're good at you singing. Are. What's the song no, no, called? I can, no, that was kind of recognizable, Ben. Um, vaguely recognizable, but then like they do. What's the like, song called? 
It's called uh, There Was Jesus by Zach Williams and Dolly Parton. But let me let me read it to you without without joking. This is the part that 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 I need to hear. I've been playing this, you know, I've been telling Alexa to sing this to me while I do the dishes. In the waiting and the searching, in the healing and the hurting, like a blessing buried in the broken pieces. Every minute, every moment, where I've been and where I'm going, even when I didn't know it or couldn't see mm -hmm. it. There was Jesus. <sighs> and she's spending millions of dollars to expand Dolly World. <laughs> and uh, I want to go there. Not sure Let's how that stay connects, with the song. But... Yeah, that song was good. <laughs> right. No, I'm, I'm, I'm dreaming about my vacation to, to Dolly World. I want to go there. And the Smoky Mountains while I'm at it. It's going to be amazing. The Smokies are gorgeous. That'll too. nourish yeah. your, your yeah. soul. Dolly World, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm down with that, dude. Live your dreams. How about you, Johnny? What's been nourishing your soul recently? I'll tell you what nourished my soul last night. Our church is doing some anti-racist consulting right now. It's a great group. Hewitt Consulting is working with us. We had a meeting last night. And afterwards, I was noticing that my body was a little bit tense. I actually think it was because I was riding my bike earlier all over Germantown. But I couldn't tell where. I, I'm trying to reorient the things I feel in like 95% of my body below, I'm pointing to the top of my head <laughs> with like, I'm just, I'm trying to figure myself out physically um, more. So I was feeling that way. And I decided instead of uh, reading an um, academic book or something like that, which is normally what I would do at night, I just index the cookbook. What does that mean? It means I flip through the cookbook and I write down recipes that look tasty and I return to the spreadsheet where it lists all the things I want to make, and then I make meal plans out of that. Now, what book was I going through, and why was it meaningful to me? It's called uh, Philistine, which is Philistine, uh, which is Palestine rather in Arabic. Just call it Philistine, and it's by Sammy Tamimi and Tara Wigley. And I'm looking through the book, and I'm noticing a surprising amount of intimacy between Palestinian culture and cuisine and mm. Egyptian culture and cuisine, which is where I'm from. And then I realized for the first time that Egypt and Palestine are actually very geographically close. <laughs> 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 and I was like, oh, mm -hmm. that's why this sounds so familiar. That's why this feels so familiar, mm -hmm. right? And there, there's, just, there's a, just a moment in connecting with my culture that way and even being seen without having to explain it and read in this story this book has stories of palestinians in it as well um so it's a really beautiful book came out last year and so i recommend it to you i think even if you're not a cook and not that interested the material is rich on its own um and it was meaningful to me too to be seen and to be known even in the context of talking about anti-racism so that was helpful to me and then it motivated me to you know keep up my uh, weekly pita bread discipline. Because in Egypt, there's a pita man who yells outside your apartment every morning to sell you pita bread. Hmm. No such man exists in North Philly, in case you were wondering. And so I have to be my own pita man, but I am. And that's that, that nourishes my soul, too. Ah, oh, you are, Johnny. That, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Music has been nourishing my soul recently. I mean, music always nourishes my soul, but this past Sunday, I had an opportunity to enjoy it outside in the park um, with some of our people. We were singing um, the old spiritual o over my head. There's music in the air. And I found myself just closing my eyes and really being able to uh, to like listen and belt it out at the, at the same time um and our leaders had our music leaders had had done this wonderful thing of like memorizing all the songs and and ditching the music stands and the papers and and even our sound gear cuz we were we were able to meet in um a space that was kind of like a concrete amphitheater for us. So it was just, you know, after after months of 
needing to mask up for our safety and, and months of not even being able to sing together in person at all. Um, I could really feel the music in the air and the, the line at the end of the song is there must be a God somewhere. And mm. uh, I, w I was feeling that yes, that resounding yes, kind of in my body. There is a God somewhere. In fact, right here. Can you sing the song us. to us? Um, is that possible? Um, we can cut it out if we don't like it. Okay. <laughs> so like, that's no pressure. It's just a if podcast, you, but I, want, I just want to hear it. Oh, if you guys join in with me, it's like, over my head, there is music in the air. Over my head. You, re you remember it? Do you guys know it? She's there leading us to worship. There is music in, in the, the air. air. Over my head. Over my head. There is music, music in, in the, the air. air. There, there must be. Be a god somewhere. That's so beautiful. Sweet. Thank you, Rachel. Ah, uh, thank you, thank you, pastors, for for sharing. Uh, may God continue to nourish our souls, and let's meet back together again here soon. Mm -hmm.